so we are live in 54321 good evening friends on behalf of delhi orthopedic association i welcome you all for the second episode of our trauma series symposium on foot injuries and the topic which has been chosen is very relevant in our day to day practice and we have a galaxy of distinguished speakers who will be deliberating on various uh, topics dr gurinder bedi a well known consultant orthopedic surgeon from delhi who is a passionate teacher and always willing to be associated with our academic activities has been kind enough to organize this event and he will be moderating this symposium today i request our secretary dr shekhar shrivastav to kindly introduce dr gurinder bedi and start the proceedings dr shekhar please thank you thank you dr atul uh, so uh, this is the second in the series of uh, online trauma uh, which we have started now this was necessitated because last time uh, last month we had planned first quarterly meet but because of again uh, covid that got postponed and we thought that the academic activity should go on uh, so this time uh, dr gurinder bedi has uh, taken over the charge of uh, arranging all the very eminent speakers for our foot and ankle problems now these are very common problems and we face them in day to day activity in our day to day practice and uh, gurinder is known to bring out the uh, finer points of managing these injuries and i am sure that uh, we won't be disappointed today because he is uh, being held by all these uh, great speakers uh, gurinder as you know is a uh, head of the department and director of orthopedics at uh, fortis uh, vasant kunj and uh, uh, i think he will introduce all the speakers and will carry on the proceedings so over to you gurinder thank you and uh, thank you so much uh, uh, atul ravi shekhar it's great and thank you so much for for allowing me to uh, to, to put up this program and really appreciate all that help and help that you guys have always put in put in behind this I think it's really, really wonderful that you've taken this opportunity to to organize this symposium. And you know, I, I mean, at the end of the day, foot and ankle is like everybody's everybody's uh, bread and butter. Everybody sees them day in day out, whether it's a ligament injury or bony injury. And I think it's very important that we sort of you know get the you know the finer points of this going. I know most of the people sort of do foot and ankle trauma, and I'm sure they are much much bigger experts than than many of us. But I think it's still worthwhile giving a podium on which people come together they discuss and actually everybody takes home a few points i think the format is absolutely wonderfully done and very very happy that we got a lot of help from so many so many uh, so many eminent people about coming together for this the enthusiasm is actually mind boggling you know there is nobody who says no you just offer it to them they say look i'll do it kind of stuff so we'll ho hopefully have a lot of case based discussions which happen in this meeting we we, we obviously have the very eminent people like like uh, kamal durida who you all, all know ravi sahuta is there vivek trika is there abhishek jain um, uh, ankit ankit is there with us so we, they all have sort of you know huge amount of experience and i'm sure it will really help getting it together on one forum it's a very very case based kind of a thing and we will hopefully skip around thing but there will be a lesson coming from everything that we show hopefully hopefully i i have actually asked uh, dr manoj not to sort of present today mainly because we we ran, ran short on time uh, my my previous mentor and uh, and, and colleague who whom i did a fellowship with uh, roger atkins has, has also joined us so i think uh, some of you might have know him so all the extended lateral approach the anatomy of the sural nerve he has somewhere about just on the calcaneum he would have somewhere about 12 articles in the journal so you can have a check on pubmed about this he's into other things as well but we'll we'll first start off with ankit hopefully it will be a quick discussion and then the questions i think checker am i right that they can be posted on the chat box uh, ravi is, is that yeah. the way we yeah. want to make it work yes sir yeah okay ankit uh, good evening everyone i start uh, uh, today's proceedings with the discussion of metatarsal neck fractures they are simple injuries uh, they are common injuries but enigmatic both to a foot and ankle surgeon and a general orthopedic surgeon alike and uh, these injuries occur either from direct falls uh, which result which result in high velocity trauma 
or they can result in a twisting injury uh, uh, of the forefoot when the hind foot or the leg is Chalo, khana khate. Aajo. So, uh, uh, chawal khalo, bahut hai. Can be divided into, uh, I think one of the uh, mics people muted. I think the host can the host can mute everyone. Pass but the meeting chal rahi. So yeah, uh, as I continue, uh, the metatarsal fractures can be uh, grouped into medial column, central column, and the lateral column, which has been you know described by Myers and et al. And I mo- mostly discuss of the central column because the lateral column will be dealt by Dr. Abhishek Jain. And medial column injuries of the first metatarsal fractures are common in pediatric age groups in children less than four years of age, and uh, they need little discussion in, in in themselves. So most metatarsal neck fractures can be successfully managed non-operatively in a cast boot. Uh, which requires uh, uh, four to six weeks of a cast boot and uh, 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 which uh, uh, weight bearing can begin from day one itself. But there are certain fractures which are uh, more than 50% translated or angulated more than 20 degrees. And when there is involvement of two or more metatarsals, which needs to be managed surgically. And why is that? It is because uh, there is a propensity for the distal fragment to angulate because the flexor tendons tend to pull the fragment more proximally as well as in a plantar flexion that leads to a disturbance of the metatarsal cascade, which can lead to post-traumatic metatarsalgia and also can lead to uh, plantar keratosis over, over time. Uh, as in this case, when, the, when these neck fractures malunite, they cause uh, significant post-traumatic metatarsalgia and can, which can lead to uh, plantar keratosis as well. Uh, various techniques have been described for reduction and fixation of these fractures over the, over the years. And people have uh, plated these fractures. They have screwed these fractures uh, with uh, relatively poor outcomes due to a lot of factors like peri-implant fractures, difficulty uh, in uh, soft tissue management and frustrating uh, uh, intraoperative steps uh, in handling the small metatarsal head fragment. And uh, intrafocal pinning is another method that has been described uh, in literature, uh, occasionally in, in the form of case reports. But most literature uh, talks of an anti-grade fixation of the metatarsal neck uh, using pre-bent K-wires or thin elastic nails, which is uh, considered the gold standard fixation. So this technique is basically based uh, on a insertion of a pre-bent K-wire or a thin elastic nail proximally, uh, which ends up uh, from the proximal shaft into the neck into the head and when this uh, bent k or, uh, or an elastic nail is twisted uh, with the uh, T-handle, the, this leads to reduction of the metatarsal head and this uh, wire can be further hammered in to uh, stabilize this reduction. So this is a fracture that I operated a few years back, multiple metatarsal neck fractures and uh, the, the bent K-wire was inserted from the proximal end and when the, uh, uh, when the uh, wire is bent, uh, when the wire is twisted, the re- uh, reduction is achieved and the reduction is further stabilized by hammering it in in, in the last step. Uh, but there are technical challenges to this technique. Uh, certain times the bones are osteoporotic. This can lead to penetration of the plantar or the dorsal cortex of the proximal metatarsal from the wire. And sometimes medullary canal can be narrow in Asian patients and making close reduction difficult uh, in these patients. So uh, one often has to resort to an open reduction uh, in these fractures when it is difficult to cannulate the distal metatarsal head, like I had had to do in this case, where I tried putting in the wire uh, into the metatarsal head distally, but uh, the wire would not go in. I had to open it up and put a wire from the plantar aspect, holding the head to the shaft. So this uh, technique, uh, uh, this open reduction uh, has been described to cause infection, non-union, and there is definitely a chance of metatarsal uh, MTP joint stiffness, which can lead to cloying. And in certain scenarios, when the head is shattered, like the, like here uh, in an open fracture where the fifth metatarsal head is shattered, it is difficult to get this reduction by uh, inserting a wire and one has to resort to open reduction and pinning of the fragments from the plantar side. So this was the case that came to me a couple of years back, which was severely osteoporotic in an elderly female, where I knew uh, to begin with that it is not possible to do an anti-grade pinning of this, of this fracture. And so I decided to do something called a transverse metatarsal cave wiring. So after a close reduction was achieved by digital uh, traction and digital pressure over the metatarsal head to counter the force of the flag- flexor tendons, uh, a transverse K wire was passed through the intact first of the fifth metatarsal head into the uh, fractured uh, head into the uh, heads of the fractured uh, uh, metatarsals, and uh, this reduction was stabilized by uh, something that, uh, called the intermetatarsal ligaments, which hold the metatarsal heads together. So this was the final result that was achieved by fixing the metatarsal heads through transverse K-wiring from the intact first or the fifth metatarsal heads. So this technique uh, uh, led to good outcomes 
in my series and uh, uh, most uh, in most patients uh, had asymptomatic union by 12 weeks and full weight bearing uh, and KY removal was done uh, after six weeks of the uh, index procedure. Uh, transverse pretarsal wiring is not something that is new. It has been done in hand. It has been described in hand literature. It has been done for boxes fracture over the years, just that it has not been described uh, in foot and ankle. Uh, uh, in my series, the only complications that I had were occasional pin loosening and, uh, and a single patient had a digital neuritis, which was transient and dissolved in four to six weeks once the wire was removed. There was no other complication, no loss of reduction and full weight bearing was achieved in six to eight weeks in all my patients and 12 weeks at 12 weeks, uh, most patients had all patients had radiographic union. Uh, so I believe that the indications of this technique is an osteoporosis in patients who have a narrow canal, in patients with severe soft tissue compromise, in a failed anti-grade pinning, which, was, uh, which has failed intraoperatively, and patients or, or uh, surgeons which have limited surgical experience or expertise or equipment in their setups. And we went on to publish this technique. We published it a couple of years back in the Indian Journal of Orthopedics, uh, where we described this technique uh, to be simple, uh, to be uh, to be uh, taking a much much lesser uh, interoperative time, and at the same time, this technique uh, could be done in patients who had uh, an interoperative failure, or uh, is an alternative to the gold standard technique, which is the anti-grade intramedullary pinning and elastic nailing, which remains gold standard for fixing the radial neck fractures. But this, uh, but a comparative study, uh, uh, but uh, you know, my uh, uh, the uh, the technique that I have described pays way for future comparison with the uh, with transfer spirit acid K wiring as well. And I thank you uh, for your patient hearing. Thank you. Dr. Bedi, you are muted. Dr. Bedi, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. yourself. That's right. Okay. So, um, Ankit, sorry, my apologies. I, I didn't realize I was muted. So, I mean, wonderful technique. I think, Ankit, I mean, you know, you've, you've made a really difficult job quite easy. Pinning the talks is not an easy job. I mean, anybody who's done it knows the, you know, the number of passes you make through it. And then invariably, I mean, it, in, in my opinion, I've done a lot of work with a lot of uh, wiring which has been down from the planter aspect what are the i mean what are the uh, what are the complications that are reported in literature from the planter pinning uh, do, do so, you do you normally get a sort of clawing kind of a thing which yeah so so in most of my patients i have not had any non unions in these fractures or infections even though it is described in literature the only thing that i've had is uh, clawing which uh, which requires some amount of physiotherapy physical therapy stretching and maybe budin sprints later on to uh, get it corrected uh, but uh, yeah, clawing and MTV stiffness is something that is fairly common. And you know, one impales the flexor tendon when once one enters to the plantar aspect. Uh, there is invariably impalement of the flexor tendon uh, when one does it. Hmm. Okay, um, guys, any any questions at all? Anybody would like to ask Ankit? There's never any need to put a, a sort of you know one above, one below, and connect it with a Jess or something. That's ne never any. Oh, yeah. can, I, I think I think we'll all agree that. No, anybody who's actually been using a jazz for a club foot knows that you can't get through more than three at one stage. So you can get three from this side or you can get about two or maximum three. I think, is that your experience as well? So my jazz fixator, would I would reserve it only for open fractures or fractures which are mostly involving uh, not the central compartment, but the, you know, the medial or the lateral, uh, uh, you know, the columns. So in those uh, fractures, they require column length restoration, which can be done with a JS fixator. In central metatarsal fractures, it is not so much the column length that is you know required to uh, required to be restored. It is something. It is it is uh, it is just that uh, one tries to prevent uh, metatarsalgia. One tries to prevent malunion in these injuries, and uh, JS fixator would not work so well in the central column as it would possibly in the uh, either of the peripheral columns. Just one tip, uh, Dr. Gurinder and Dr. Ankit. Uh, uh, what we do is uh, uh, exactly uh, what Ankit described, but uh, I actually you uh, cut off the tip of the K wire and make it blunt uh, because I in osteoporotic it is easy to pass, and uh, then you can pass one or two or three uh, wires uh, instead of just passing one wire, and it doesn't uh, you know uh, enter the uh, disc or pass through the head of the uh, metatarsals. Uh, it gives a good stability and a, a, you just talk the canal, especially in osteoporotic elderly women uh, or patients. 
I agree, sir. That that continues to be the gold standard method. I try to put in anti-grade pins as much as possible. It is just that in cases where I feel that it may not be really successful, and in osteoporotic thing, people with narrow canal, I would rather go over transverse midazole K wiring straight away rather than. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Ankit, uh, very quickly, the entry point on the midazole, if you're going from the base, is it? Do you come from the top or do you come from the side when you make an entry hole? so i would uh, mostly make make it dorsal lateral i would not you know put it on on one side not exactly dorsal not exactly lateral i would put it slightly dorsal lateral okay uh, if it's okay i'll just do this uh, small little thing i mean as we just uh, thought that mid foot may have not been covered although now i did now i realize that kamal is also doing a little bit of it so i'm just going to you know i i think the problem is you can get so myopic because when you attend so many meetings and all you think this frank is sort of you know that common it's It's sounding common as in a Jones fracture now by the number of meetings because every meeting has a Liz Frank lecture kind of stuff. So maybe it was my error, but fortunately my colleague sort of pointed it out that I think we still need to do something about uh, Liz Frank injuries as well. So I think Liz Frank one thing which is very very useful has been the number of meetings we've had, especially with foot and ankle. And one thing that has come out through is we've discussed Liz Frank very very well. And I can tell you, it's made a big dent on my practice because at one time we would see so many Liz Franks neglected being posted, but we hardly ever actually see Liz Franks coming. Well, very very few Liz Franks come. So one is one big thing that has happened is the recognition. It's everybody now picks up. Oh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people now pick Villa. So the neglected cases are 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 less. The other thing is we now so much more because so much have been published on it, and what has really happened is the implants have got much much better, and we under understand the protocols. By implants, I mean you know initially we were just putting screws all over. This is one of our 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 cases only. But I think you know the use of plates has actually made a sea of a difference in terms of what we do. And I I would be uh, I mean I think I would be the right one to say that we have actually switched a lot to plates compared to screws. Lots of reasons for that. Why we think it might be better. But, you know i mean again it's i'm not saying anything wrong with screws but plates seem to be for me the way to go so the philosophy of treatment i think is is fairly well understood the medial column which we all know is a stiff column you need to give it stability the lateral column needs to be aligned but allowed to move you need to restore your anatomies in terms of the alignment the orientation and all you need to understand the difference between medial and lateral column i'm not going to go into the details open reduction presently is a gold standard so even though you think look i've really got it right i don't need to do it it's still worthwhile making an incision for doing it normally for a full for a full blown uh, less frank you, you need two a two uh, two incision technique is ideal i've never actually done a three incision technique till now the first one is between the the one and two metatarsals and the last and the next one is over the fourth or between the fourth and the fifth metatarsal needless to say everybody is now sort of fixing it rigidly on the on the medial column flexibly on the lateral column i've tried to go with the idea that all of you are fairly first with the management of this so may i'm not going to go into the basics of this the controversies which come is things like whether you should fuse whether you should just leave a load the problem came when the south african surgeon printed this this publication in which he discussed that that the fusions were actually doing better i think not everybody is doing complete fusions at least even now i think it's it's a mixture of things so There are horses for courses, so people can be different. But screws across the joint, I have a slight amount of hesitation, especially if you really believe that I want to go in and take out the implant. Much better the articular cartilage is not huge. Much better than to not destroy the articular cartilage, but put a plate across, which can be removed. I know most people don't end up removing it. So here's a quick example. There's a 36-year-old man. Most of them are motorcyclists. I think, as most of you will see, he's he's on a motorcycle. He's wearing slippers like most people do, and he he comes across from this, and this is the injury that he's got. It's a slightly more complex injury, but I'm really wanting to focus much more on the on the Liz Frank element. So you can see the amount of combination out there on 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 the especially at the base of the second base of the third. I know there is a navicular fracture. The the cuboid also seems shattered. What I would like to talk about is the fact that you know the combination is the biggest issue that you used to get. Initially, we used to have only screws, so we didn't know what to do. But when it was combinated, we didn't, you know, we would try to put some screws here and there. Normally, we would just completely miss that and just go for the, you know, the the, the drive home kind of a screw from there to there. But now we know that, you know, given the plates and all, we we can actually do better. So this is an this is a uh, again the CT scan. Again, I think needless to say, a CT scan is a must, must, must for all Liz Franks. Whether you wherever you're working, still ideally need a Liz Frank uh, a CT scan. Not a great idea managing. 
to be very surprised that there's some other injuries which will spring up if you if you don't sort of get a CT scan. So here's an example. I mean, just to confirm that it, it is what, what I'm saying. It is as a base of the second metatarsal, and you can see that the the, the list frank ligament will be connected. It's definitely fractured, and it's likely to be sort of you know completely disrupted. And you can see that although they seem to be aligned with each other. There's no way that the list frank ligament is, is intact in this. And there are more CT scans. Again, remember, we are also looking at the other fracture in this. Here's, here's a good CT scan, which actually shows a reconstruction. So you couldn't really put a screw in this. Even if you could, you couldn't really get a good hold in the intermediate cuneiform. And remember, we have to fix the lateral side as well. And again, similar kind of problems we're going to see when we try to fix in there. Bias is never, 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 never the, never the best solution for that. So that, that goes out, out of the window. Fortunately, again, just having a look at the base of the metatarsal and the combination that, that you can see in there. This is just appreciating the extent of the injury which can happen. It's not the sort of, you know, world's biggest injury to, to notice. But, you know, you can see that it's not, not going to be the easiest of thing. So this is what we did. This is what I meant by using plates across. So you can actually put a screw much away from the fracture. And again, much away from the fracture, and these are locking screws, give you very good hold. It's just a spanning thing which you need to put in. And again, the drive home screw, which you can put from the second MD to the middle cuneiform or from the Munich from the middle cuneiform to there. It depends on the configuration. What has been done out here is a lateral bridging plate has been applied, which basically distracts the whole thing, keeps the cuboid in length, actually helps you in, even in reducing the navicular, some screws going into the navicular. Remember, if you see no screw between the second and the middle cuneiform, something is not right. So you need to see that screw all the time. And this is what eventually happens. He goes on to unite. We actually told him to come for implant removal. If you're using a bridging plate, the patient was tied up with his COVID issues and all has never really come back. But he's walking and all. There is some amount of swelling, not denying that, but he's doing very well. So in, in, in our indications, Definite indication for a fusion would be a delayed presentation. We would always do it for a delayed presentation. Severe combination at the base, which I just said, and a pure ligamentous injury is, is for us a, 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 a given for what you. So this was a late presentation. We've used the plate and tried to reduce it. And that's what it, it, it fuses quite well. There isn't much. You just need to scrape the surfaces and normally fuse, fuses quite, quite well. So here's another example of a delayed presentation. Again, this uh, this, this lady had, had, had a Liz Frank injury, which was ignored, neglected, whichever way you look at it. And you can see that the, uh, the second MT is, is riding dorsally. And uh, that needs to be put back. She's actually already developing arthritis at the base of the base of the uh, 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 second empty. And this was mainly because the instability which was there, which was obviously confirmed on the on the, uh, on the MRI scan. So this is a fairly common thing if you leave a list frank alone, is the base of the second empty because of the abnormal movement, movement which happens there, just the MRI scans which confirm it. And this is the, again, another pattern of using a plate the, the plate for fusion this is a given for us if you if you're going to present late that you're going to get the, the, something like this kind of a plate there are indian mix there are, uh there are open mix would you actually ever do it cutaneous if it looked very good is a ct ct scan which shows the obvious this frank kind of an injury no points for diagnosing that it was in one of our cases i just saw it as a as, as a second request from somebody so he's used these accutrax screws which are brilliant screws there isn't a huge amount of hold which is managed to get. I have actually avoided doing percutaneous fixations in these fractures. I really want to visualize it. I know people are good enough to actually do it without that. My personal suggestion is this screw eventually broke, but it seems to have worked for, for this patient. But my personal take on this is I would much rather much rather go with the open, open adduction. So the the essence is you need to diagnose it, diagnose it early. If the patient has too much of swelling but a completely disrupted foot, please try to pin, pin it with something because the swelling doesn't come down for a good three weeks if you leave it dislocated. So even if you think, look, I can't do an open reduction, please try to pin it in place. Then you need to think about your implants. For me, the plate is becoming the go-to. You need to protect the repair, irrespective of the best plate that you use. You need somewhere about six weeks in a plaster and at least another six weeks with an arch, if not a modified arch into it. The rehab is really long. The foot stiffness doesn't go for a very, very long, long time. So you need to protect it. So don't get into a mess with it in, in, in between. So it's, it's 
can be a big problem in spite of the fact that you've actually done a very, very good job. But I can tell you the plate is a big decision change maker for us. So we, 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 I mean, I think just like all of you, we've done, we've done a few, and I think we're getting better at better at doing this. I'm just going to leave, uh, leave my screen so Roger can pick on the screen if he can start his screen share, and uh, I'll take any questions. Um, so uh, the well, one of the questions is uh, pins or nails requ uh, require removal. I, I um, with it, is that for uh, the mirror castle or for the uh, list rank? Um, um, I think uh, Ankit, this question must be for you. I think you already answered. So. That's okay, yeah. mirror castle. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, I think you you're going to remove all the all the all the wires, right? Yeah, by six to eight weeks once the fracture consolidates. Perfect. The, okay. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, can I just take? I think Sandeep is an old, old friend. So he just put a message about the uh, uh, Jess in in um, the Jess, which is that mini mini fixator that all of us have had some experience in using in one way or the other. I think we all love the Jess fixators, don't we? I think we've all nobody who's not really used it, whether in the hand or the hand or the feet. So I have never used a fixator at all. Um, I think life is very, very difficult when you put an external fixator on the foot. I'm actually very, very happy now. We've used a lot of bridging plates on the feet. The concept comes from the, you know, the lower end radius concept, which was there that you, you know, you have a very comminuted kind of a thing and you go across from the radius to the mirror tassel and you ignore the in-between. We've tried to, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the, the original one for this, but we've tried to bridge it, especially for the navicular and the cuboid fractures. It has actually worked very, very well for us, and but never put the plate inside, but nothing, nothing there. So we, uh, uh, so nothing as an external fixer. I think you know it'll be almost cruel to put an external fixator on the foot on an adult and expect him because he's not going to be able to wear shoes. He's not going to be able to go to bed without you know twisting and turning his external fixator. Might be a little bit cruel, especially when you have so many good implants available nowadays. So the uh, Vijay, there is no specific implant for Liz Frank, but the, you know, there are a lot of other plates, so you, you need to get the whole set. And the set gives you the options, then you have a look at the configuration and say which plate fits in kind of a, uh, for this kind of stuff. So the get the whole set. Whenever you get the AO foot set is the, is the ideal one which you should have with you. But um, I prefer the smaller plates. The dedicated foot plates is the, is, is the way to go. Uh, Ravi, I mean, is, is that right? Is that something that you, you're doing as well? Uh, mute, mute, mute. Yeah, I always, yeah, I always keep the whole foot set. Whole foot. I think a variety of T plates, straight plates, and then you you see which one fits and is able to stabilize your fracture. Perfect. Yeah. Um, anybody wants to add something on this? Um, Vivek, you do a lot. Uh, there a lot are of there are specific plates which are there for foot and list francs especially. Uh, you have a triangular one, a rectangular one, a rhomboid ones, which you can fix as you have shown in one of your cases as well, which fixes the two metatarsals, the first one along with the cuneiforms, sparing the joint and then fixing with one screws, which can have compression and locking screws both in their places. But they need to fit properly and get into the center of the metatarsal, which becomes slightly difficult, in, especially in Indian population. I, I, I agree. You need to really work on getting it right. And, and I can tell you the incision is no smaller or no, uh, no smaller, no bigger. So the same kind of proper incision is what we really, really want. Uh, if there are no questions, can I, uh, can I, uh, can I, uh, Harmeet, sorry, carry yeah. on. Harmeet. Yeah, good enough. So <clears throat> concept of putting screws was always that one screw has to go from the base of uh, second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform. Yes. In plates, there is no screw going in that direction. So, so the, uh, what so it is like. Uh, okay, so um, as far as I'm concerned, I always will go ahead and put that screw uh, separate. So I, I, I'd still go in and put that screw because, I mean, I'd really get that, you know, nice feeling when I actually reduce it down. For me, that screw still works. Some of the plates allow one screw to go in as well. Not all of them. There are one or two plates which actually allow the sort of an obliquish kind of a screw to go in our image. But I, I've always used a separate screw. So this screw is uh, called home run screw. Home run and screw. you need to pass it before you put the plate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
that okay uh, summer yeah. has just informed us that there's some good yeah. outfit spray as well which i think he's had experience with which which, which can be used uh, can i uh, can i um, dhruv can i request you to uh, mute yourself uh, yeah, Okay. Uh, can I uh, have the pleasure of now introducing my my, my my senior colleague, my mentor, and somebody I, I sort of spent uh, a good six months annoying him uh, with, uh, with, 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 my, with my work in uh, in Bristol. So that was uh, six very very useful months for me. So Roger's been a very uh, very useful person for me. I mean, I still throw him so many cases, and which he's very very kindly always comes back and helps me out with. He's a very well known figure uh, uh, figure within UK. But, some unknown reasons he's he sort of traveled i know he's traveled to the up uh, the, the up con or something at at one time but we've never actually had you over 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 in delhi so roger i think you've you quit your nhs practice now you're in complete private practice and i understand you beside your work in other things you're actually now working on some computerized uh, systems for fixing fragments am i am i right when i say that you're muted roger you'll have to come out of that uh, uh, there's a there's sorry. a wonderful you, you go first, Roger, because if you can go first. Okay, so I still work part-time in the NHS and part-time in private practice. And yes, I'm working on developing new designs and uh, computerized and robotic systems and things like that, which may or may not ever do anything. I don't know. We shall see. Sure. sure. So, uh, Roger is a man who's actually sort of, you know, at one stage when nobody wanted to do a calcaneum fracture, I mean, he sent... You know, he, he 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 came back, started practicing in Bristol, and said a letter off to everybody. Look, I'm in Bristol doing calcaneum practice, and you know everybody wanted to get rid of them. So we're talking about 35, 40 years back, and everybody just kept on sending them, and you know he just kept on accumulating them. And actually, he never really got taught calcaneum by anybody, but he just learned it himself. Then he went on to write a lot of the articles about this, starting from the extended approach to the anatomy of the sural nerve to the different patterns of fracture. And he came out with his own classification as well, which is actually printed in the, in, in the journal as well. We, he, he has been doing the injured foot course, which is now called as the AO Masters course on, on, on foot injuries for, I don't know, I think I, I, I helped you out with about four of them. So it must have been somewhere about a dozen of them you, you, you've done all by yourself. It was only being done in Bristol at that time. I don't know what the status is now. Roger, can I ask you for your for your for your talk on calcaneum fractures? It's everything. Everything you've done, are you going to concise it in that 30 minutes? We're not giving you okay. more time. I will do my best. Assuming that uh, Zoom will work for us. Um, let's see. So is that working? Can you see awesome? Uh, awesome. Yes. You got it. Okay. So let's begin by saying thank you very much for Dr. Bedi Gurinder for inviting me to give this talk. And let's go back to a very long time ago. In 1980, I was a casualty officer, a junior SHO, the John Radcliffe Hospital, and I saw a 38-year-old manual worker who fell at work. He broke one calcaneum, and I can remember John Cocking, who was then the senior trauma surgeon in Oxford, saying, well, that's the end of that. He will never work again. And he didn't ever work again. So if we go back to 1916 and 1917, the greats of surgery knew that a calcaneal fracture was the end of your career. You would never work again. So let's fast forward. In 2017, a 37-year-old circus artist, she was a somebody who worked on trapezes and did all sorts of tumbling and things, fell from her trapeze 14 feet, and these are her two feet. And she decided to travel to see me, which was a long way to come. And I treated her somewhat differently. And those are the two calcaneal fractures after internal fixation and recovery and healing at about six months. And her outcome is that she is completely asymptomatic. She has full joint movement. She's returned to work at a circus without limit. And the only problem she gets is these two screws here, a little bit prominent, but she refused to have them removed. 
And this talk then, and this is Gurinder's uh, kind poster about me, this talk is how we got from a situation where a calcaneal fracture was the end of your career to how we got to the point where in appropriate individuals, you can get a normal outcome from a calcaneal fracture. So these are the things I'm going to talk about. What the fracture is, how you can think of approaching it, the surgery, the plates you can use, and does it work? So let's start with the nature of the fracture. So the problem with the calcaneum is it, it is not a nice regular bone. It doesn't look like a dog's bone yet, a dog's biscuit. And so the actual nature of the fracture is very poorly understood. And therefore, it's very difficult to get to grips with how you might go about fixing it. So let's start by talking about the nature of the fracture. And these are three views of a calcaneum. This is from the superior view. This is from the medial view. And this is from the lateral view. So, standard calcaneal fracture will occur when you hit the ground from about six to eight feet. And the first thing that happens is called the primary fracture line. And it goes like that. It divides the calcaneum essentially in the sagittal plane, leaving a large medial fragment, sorry, a medial fragment and a lateral fragment. Now, that fracture exists, and we need to look at it for a moment. But first of all, we need to consider the other fracture lines that occur. And the next two fracture lines always occur together. The coronal fracture line splits the calcaneum like that and usually goes right across medially. The secondary fracture line goes round the back behind the posterior facet, Normally, it goes just behind the posterior facet, but in about 30%, it goes right round the back. And that is what a calcaneal fracture is. So there are five fragments which are named. The sustentacular fragment, which contains the sustentaculum tali, and very importantly, is firmly bound to the talus and the medial malleolus, so it simply doesn't move. The body fragment, which contains the heel strike point and no articular cartilage. The anterolateral fragment, which contains the lateral part of the calcaneal cuboid joint. The lateral joint fragment, which is this fragment here and contains the lateral part of the posterior facet. And the anteromedial fragment, which is the fragment that's most difficult to access during internal fixation. And we'll come round to whether accessing that matters in a bit. The lateral joint fragment is either a semi-lunar central joint depression fragment, as shown here, or it is a much larger tuberosity type fragment, as shown with the T there. That's Essex Lepresti's original classification. That is what 80 to 90% of calcaneal fractures are, and I don't have time to talk about the other fracture types at the moment. Let's talk about how the fracture develops. This is a semi-coronal view of a calcaneum, lateral side, medial side, talus. We're going to hit the ground from about six to eight feet. And as we do so, we generate our primary fracture line separating the medial fragment from the lateral fragment. And that is a two-part fracture. That fracture exists. And as it develops, sometimes this large lateral fragment dislocates laterally. And that's what you're seeing here. You can see the body of the calcaneum is dislocated lateral to the talus. So this is a two-part fracture dislocation. And you can see there's a fracture of the fibula, which has occurred as the body of the calcaneum hits the fibula. And you can see that it subluxed the ankle joint. 
Now, the problem with this injury is that it occurs following very minor trauma. It's not very common. And this is an example. So here you see the ankle subluxation, the fracture of the lateral malleolus. And that leads the casualty officer to just think this is a simple lateral malleolar fracture. You can also see the dislocated body of the calcaneum. And on the lateral view, if you're careful, you can see that something's seriously wrong, but actually Bowler's angle looks normal. So these are often managed conservatively. Treated operatively, you can see that we've now restored anatomy. If you leave this conservatively treated, what happens is the patient gets better for about two months. They then gradually in, in inexorably get worse until eventually the midfoot turns inside out and all you can do is a triple fusion. Secondary reconstruction of these, even up to three months, is not overwhelmingly difficult and should be done. This is another such case. This is the other time you can get a two-part fracture dislocation. This was a man in his 40s following a road traffic accident. The green arrows are pointing to the body of the calcaneum. And here you can see how it's up against lateral malleolus. And that's the body of the calcaneum that has fractured the lateral malleolus. That's the CT scan, which obviously shows a dislocated body of calcaneum. So primarily, it's relatively simple simply to reduce this manually. And secondarily, you can simply fix the fracture through a lateral approach. This is relatively simple surgery that ought to be done. But let's return now to our calcaneal fracture. We've developed our primary fracture line. We're now going to consider further development. And you know that there's the two secondary fracture lines, the longitudinal and coronal secondary fracture line. So as the lateral part of the calcaneum is pushed up against the talus, the secondary fracture lines develop and the body moves laterally and rotates into varus. And the medial and lateral fragments, this one being the sustentacular fragment, this one being the lateral joint fragment, rotate outwards. And that produces this appearance on a CT scan. The lateral joint fragment is rotated outwards, the sustentacular fragment rotated inwards. The body fragment moves up laterally and rotates inwards. And that is sometimes called an inverted Y fracture because here you see an apparent Y appearance. And this is very important because this is the standard calcaneal fracture and will indicate to us how we should fix it if that's what we're intending to do. In about 10 to 20% of cases, osteoporotic or high violence injury, you get a slightly different thing. The lateral wall remains intact and the lateral joint fragment is depressed downwards. And that produces this appearance with a truly depressed lateral joint fragment. And these will do very badly if treated conservatively. Importantly, the lateral wall is part of the body fragment. So when you go in from the lateral side, you meet a solid wall of calcaneum. And you have to realize that that has to be formally osteotomized to get to the lateral joint fragment. Radiographic assessment, CT scan with reconstruction and plain x-rays will tell you everything you need to know. Now, I'm now going to go on to soft tissue problems and Dr. Betty asked me to stop from time to time to invite questions. So I'll stop there and invite any of you who want to ask questions on what I've said so far to 
ask any questions, assuming that is I can work out how to do this on Zoom, and then we'll move on when you're all happy. Okay? So are there any questions so far? Uh, I will, sorry. No, I think, uh, guys, any, any anything, any, anybody wants to butt in with right now? Any Anything? Or should we just let Prof carry on? Carry on. Okay. Let's go. Okay, I shall just carry on. So the soft tissue problems are sural nerve damage and wound breakdown. Now, today, it is very easy to forget that when I started fixing calcaneal fractures, and I can still remember, and Gurinder will no doubt know to whom I'm referring, when I was in the middle of fixing a calcaneal fracture, a very senior knee surgeon walked into my theater, looked over my shoulder and said, Roger, you are going to be struck off shortly after this patient has his amputation for intractable infection. And the point was that in those days, and we're now talking 1990, calcaneal fracture fixation was condemned because of wound breakdown. And that's the sort of thing that happened over and over again. And of course, that is likely to be an amputation. These days, we can salvage it with a plastic surgical free flap. But back in the 1990s and 1980s and 1970s, those things didn't exist. So the next thing we need to talk about is the development of a safe soft tissue approach to this fracture. So the first thing to talk about is the less important thing, which is sural nerve damage. That is a patient who has a complete sural nerve palsy following an injudicious approach to the posterior lateral aspect of the foot. And the patched area is where he's numb. If you dissect out the sural nerve, as we did on a number of occasions to try and work out what was going on, you find that there are calcaneal branches anterior branches, distal trunks, and inferior branches. And the obvious conclusion is if your incision goes across the lateral side of the foot, you will divide the sensory supply. So you must do an incision round the back to avoid the sural nerve. We also found that the position of the sural nerve was relatively inconstant. You couldn't make an incision that you could guarantee would avoid it. Then we need to move on to the anatomy of the posterior lateral aspect of the heel. And the anatomy is best described as consisting of two triangles. So this is a dissection I did. And what you're looking at here is what we call the superficial triangle. This lies broadly in the sagittal plane and posteriorly, it's bounded by the Achilles tendon and soleus, anteriorly by the peroneal tendons, and inferiorly by the superior border of the calcaneum. If you enter that triangle and turn 90 degrees forwards, you come to the deep triangle, which is bounded laterally by the peronee, here, medially by flexor hallucis longus, and inferiorly by the calcaneus. And those triangles contain two very important structures. The sural nerve we've already talked about, and that's the sural nerve there, which for the purposes of this illustration has been divided and turned down. And that's been done to illustrate this which is the posterior peroneal artery. That artery is the arterial supply to the lateral border of the foot. That's the sural nerve. And if you put the sural nerve back where it belongs, the sural nerve crosses the posterior peroneal artery at the level of the superior border of the calcaneum. So if you identify the sural nerve, you will have divided the posterior peroneal artery. 
Now, this is a uh, diagram from a book by a guy called Salmon in 1956. And what he did was to dissect out the cutaneous angiosomes of the limb. And this is the posterior perineal cutaneous angiosome. And the arrows are where there are anastomoses between the cutaneous angiosomes. And you can see there are no arrows here and there are no arrows here. And the point is that the posterior perineal artery is an end artery without anastomoses. And so if you are going to explore this area, particularly in a traumatized limb, you must dissect out that cutaneous angiosome. Otherwise, your wounds will break down. So this is from the orthopedic knowledge update some years ago, foot and ankle, and this is the wrong incision. And I can explain where that incision came from, but I don't particularly have time. What we're going to do is a much more radical incision and it's shown there. The key thing is this level, it is at the corner between the lateral border of the foot and the inferior border of the foot. The corner between the sole of the foot, so literally the lateral edge of the callus and the vertical tissue on the lateral side of the foot. It is well below the bruising. Posteriorly, it goes into the midline to avoid the sural nerve. And if you do that incision, and there it is shown, it is very radical. In a trauma case, I split the short abductor of the hind foot. And that incision, done properly, heals very well. And we'll come back to that in a minute when we're discussing the outcome of calcaneal fracture fixation at the very end. So I'm happy to stop again before showing you an illustration of the operation so we can discuss the approach or I'll carry on as you wish. So carry on, Chief. Carry on. Okay, that's fine. So this is an illustration of operation. The one I've picked is one I did some time ago and there are reasons for picking this particular one. And I'll show you some later operations later on. So the first questions we have to ask ourselves are who should you operate on? And these are the sort of things you ought to be considering, age, fitness, smoking, occupation, how displacement, how displaced is it? Predicted outcome, what is the ease of surgery? I will short what I'm gonna say at the very end, which is that if you do these fractures and fix them in well-motivated patients and get an anatomic reduction, you get a very, very good result. And what you have to ask yourself is what is the lifetime expectation of this person with and without surgery? When should you operate? As soon as possible, allowing the soft tissues to settle. If you're really, really, really lucky, you may get to do one within six hours of the injury. And if you get such a case, they are the easiest cases to do in the world because nothing's become fixed and you can simply open the heel up and put everything back where it belongs. But of course, it's very rare that we can do that. <coughs> so this is the patient we're going to look at. Uh, it's an Essex Lepresti tuberosity type fracture. Oops, moved on again. It's a Sanders type three because the posterior of sets in three parts. And that would be a CC, which means it's quite difficult. It's an Atkins type two fracture. And you can see that there's a large anterior fragment and there's no separate anterior medial fragment, although there is a secondary fracture there. It's absolutely flat, 
and Berlus Angler's reverse. So if we don't fix it, it will do badly, historically speaking. So we wait for the soft tissues to settle. And here you can see they've just about settled. This is my standard position, lateral position. I like putting the foot on a pillow. These days, I put a tourniquet on, I don't inflate it. There's the incision. You see, it's just at the level where the normal lateral skin joins the plantar callus skin. You can see it gets to the lateral side of the heel, goes back into the midline, well distal to the bruising. You've got to be radical. Goes down to the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. This is a big incision. Develop it at the tip, because here you're well below the calcaneum. And then develop a triangle and just keep going developing the triangle until you get to there. Then you're faced with the lateral wall. Take the lateral wall fragment out and don't lose it. And then you're faced with the lateral joint fragment. Take that out, give it to the nurse, don't lose it. Then in the middle, you see the central fragment, which we will put back on with a small uh, differential pitch screw. But we need to draw attention to this point here. This is the body fragment. This is the, ooh, brain gone dead for a moment. This is the sustentacular fragment. These two are overlapped. This fragment is at least a centimeter further up than it needs to be. And if you are going to reduce and fix this fracture, you've got to move this thing down. So the way to do that is to put an I use neo periosteal elevator down through there, rotate it round below the sustentacular fragment and gradually, gradually over a period of five minutes or so, pull the body fragment down. So what you're doing is this. Here is the lateral joint fragment we've taken out. Here is our primary fracture line. We are going to push, oh sorry, there is the posterior tibial neurovascular bundle. So with some care, we will push our instrument down there and gradually pull the body fragment downwards. And there it is, there you see my periosteal elevator has pulled the body fragment there, down well below the sustentacular fragment there. So going back very quickly, there, body fragment, sustentacular fragment. Move on, there, body fragment, way below sustentacular fragment. And there we're putting the intermediate fragment back on. This is subtalar joint. And then you simply put everything back on and fix the fracture. This is obviously an old plate and I deliberately included this one and I'll show you why in a moment. And that's the preoperative view and these are postoperative views, anatomic reduction. Provided the patient is well motivated, he will do very well indeed. Just draw your attention to a moment. The anterior fixation, there are no screws into the anterior fragment. The screws are into the sustentacular fragment. And that plus that two hole plate used as a buttress will stabilize the front of this calcaneum, but not perfectly. A small digression, most compound fractures have a medial compound wound which is due to the sustentacular fragment displacing and moving through the medial side. They are very well treated. There's an example, sustentacular fragment going through the medial side of the foot. They're very well treated by open reduction internal fixation, as I've just indicated. This is a totally different beast. This is a fracture dislocation of the hind foot with compound injuries, often in the plantar aspect, sometimes anterolaterally. These injuries do best 
if you restore the shape of the foot, but that's a talk for another time. Now, I'm happy to stop or move on. My next subject is going to be which plate should you use? If you've got questions now, or if you want to ask questions at the end, it's entirely up to you. Let's keep going. Okay, which plate? So this was the first plate that really worked for calcaneal fractures. And some of you may think this is historic, but it's still on the AO set and it's still a jolly good plate. If you're dealing with one of these fractures, which is 80% of calcaneal fractures, what I'm calling the inverted Y, this works brilliantly because once you've reduced the body fragment onto the sustentacular fragment, you want the body fragment just to slide upwards slightly against the body of bone that's produced by the lateral joint fragment and sustentacular fragment, which have been fixed. And these non-locking screws allow that to happen. So use this plate and the back of the calcaneum fixes, sorry, unites very quickly. But I've deliberately chosen this one. Look at the front here. This is not properly reduced. And the problem with this plate is that it does not allow you adequately to address the front of the calcaneum. Now, it will be a talk for another time to make the point that actually, although we've got a malreduced calcaneal cuboid joint, that does not actually hugely affect the function of the foot. But that's not a talk for today. So this is one of the patients I showed you earlier. This is using a modern 2.7 meter locking plate. This is not an inverted Y fracture. This is a highly unstable fracture. So we need locking screws all the way around there. This is a lady. She's not that large. So I'm going to use 2.7 millimeter screws. So this is a 2.7 millimeter locking plate, which has numerous screw options. You've then got to decide whether locking or non-locking, and I will show you in a minute some non-locking options in a modern plate. Do you like stainless steel or titanium? I like stainless steel for the hind foot, although somebody was pointing out that there's very good list Frank's joint, list Frank plates on the Arthrex set, and I routinely use the Arthrex pie plate for my second and third fixations in a list frank, and that's titanium. But for this, I prefer stainless steel. So there's a 2.7 locking plate. Here is a much bigger patient, and I've used a 3.5 locking plate, so that I've got good locking options for the anterior part, but these screws, these screws you can see are not locking screws, because I want that inverted Y configuration posteriorly to collapse just a little bit to encourage heal. So those are the issues for which plate you should use. That brings us to does it work? And since you've not asked questions so far, I'll just move straight on. The historic series all said calcaneal fracture fixation works. And then the Canadian multi-center study came out and their headline figure was open induction internal fixation is no better than non-operative treatment. But I just want you to look at this slide. I am not interested in studying throwing a plate at a calcaneum and failing to reduce it. This study actually demonstrated that if you reduce your fracture anatomically, they do better than if you don't fix them. It also demonstrated that if you fix them and fix them badly, they don't do any worse than non-operative treatment. So if you take that study properly, and if you are capable of reducing the fracture anatomically, that study supports open reduction and in internal fixation. Which brings us on to this ghastly study. 
And this is Damien Griffin's study of calcaneal fracture fixation. And this is the BMJ article headline, fixing fractures doesn't do any good. This is a very, very, very odd study. It's a very odd study because of the philosophy behind it. And the philosophy behind it is this. We know that there are some calcaneal fractures that everybody would fix. If you've got a totally displaced calcaneum, nobody in their right mind, if it's dislocated, would think of leaving it alone. On the other hand, on the other end of the scale, there are a number of fractures that nobody would think of fixing, a totally undisplaced calcaneal fracture. And that means that somewhere in the middle, there must be some fractures that we just don't know whether we should fix or not. And this study randomized those fractures and only those fractures. So the first thing to say is that if you think you can improve a patient by fixing their calcaneal fracture, this study is completely irrelevant to what your clinical decision is. Because this study only applies to those cases where you genuinely don't know if you will make them better by internal fixation. Which leads me to my first question, which is this. As a clinician, if I don't know if I'm going to make a patient better by fixing their calcaneum, it means it's not very displaced. And I wouldn't dream of offering them internal fixation because it's nasty. So I think this study is, it is completely and utterly irrelevant. But then we come to all the problems with the study. So the first problem is that their recruitment was incredibly small. That's this line here. That means there's a selection bias. The second problem is that they used my calcaneal fracture scoring system, which is specifically only usable in unilateral fractures. And I told Damien that when he set up the study, but he insisted including bilateral fractures. That immediately invalidates the study. The third problem is this, a 19% wound infection rate. They are not putting the wound in the right place. They are not doing it properly. Next problem is this one. I am not interested in poorly reduced fractures. If you can't reduce the fracture, you should not be doing the surgery. You should be sending it to somebody who knows how to do it. So for me, this study is, I'm afraid, irrelevant. And this is their results. And I'm not gonna bore you greatly with their results, but what they actually did was to demonstrate that they could not improve the outcome above Astley, Cooper and Cotton. So I'm just going to put my patient onto this study, the patient I showed you at the beginning, the surgeon artist, so the circus artist. Those are her results. That's how well she did. So I would go to the very end of this study where they actually admit that it's possible that somebody who knew how to fix the fracture would get a better result. So my personal experience is that if you have a well-motivated patient and you produce an anatomic reduction, they do very well. But it is a painful surgery that they have got to get over. So that's my take on calcaneal fractures. RMAtkins.org is a website that I'm producing, which is going to have all of these lectures and all of this information on it free to view. It is not up and running yet. If I am spared, I hope it will be within a few months. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to take any questions.
So the sinus tarsi approach is ideal for anterior fractures of the calcaneum. And those fractures I really include as part of Chopin joint injuries. And you showed a combined Chopin and a Sprack joint injury, which you dealt with very well indeed. Um, the problem with the sinus tarsi approach is that you, in, if you're going to reduce the body fragment, you've got to use an external fixator to pull it down out of the way. If you've got a simple Sanders type two, i.e. the posterior facet is divided into two parts, and particularly if the fracture line in the posterior facet is not too medial, then you can reduce those fractures. You can use an external fixator to pull the body fragment down. You can then reduce the, you, you get a good view of the posture of set, you can see that you reduced it, you can put a single screw across it, you can get very nicely to the anterolateral and medial fragments, and then you can put one of the, um, as you probably know, synthes now design a sinus tarsi plate that you can put on. So I do use that approach. It's it is kinder for the patient. I can do an extended lateral approach to a calcaneum in somewhere in the region of seven minutes. So I can fix a simple calcaneal fracture in under 40 minutes, top to bottom, without a tourniquet. If I'm fiddling around with the sinus tarsi approach, it takes me a heck of a lot longer and I don't get as good a reduction. So that's where I am on that. Um, I'll just ask a, a question which have been posted. What's your ideal patient for a, for a non-operative treatment? Very, very quick. Non well, non-operative treatment would either be somebody with an undisplaced fracture or would be somebody who is relatively old and unfit um, or a smoker who intractably won't stop smoking. It comes down to this question, how are they going to do with and without internal fixation? So... I've recently had to reconstruct a calcaneum on a 67 year old man who was a chronic smoker and he had a pretty much a two part fracture dislocation. And he came back after three months after non-operative treatment, he was basically unable to walk. So I had to do an extended lateral approach and do a malunion reconstruction. The extended lateral approach broke down completely because he was an arteriopath. But it's fine, it, it's healing up. And six months later, it's nearly healed, conservative treatment. I would have much preferred that that had been fixed primarily. It could have been approached through a sinus tarsi approach, if needs be, just to get the whole thing back roughly in place. Uh, do I ever do primary interoperative bone grafting? Mm. So the answer to that is for the inverted Y-type fracture, never. For Malgen-type fractures, i.e. ones with true lateral joint depression, you end up with a big hole underneath the calcaneum. Usually I don't do it primarily, but I keep a careful eye on the patient and sometimes they end up with a non-union, in which case I will go in at about three months, freshen it all up, take the plate out, fill the central bit with bone graft. I do not do primary bone grafting. If you've got a proper reduction, there is rarely anywhere to put bone graft. If you think you need to put a lot of bone graft in, you should consider that you have not got a decent reduction. Which CT scan is best to view the fracture pattern? Ah, if you are starting out, the answer to that is a semi-coronal CT scan. 
uh, which is a CT scan, which basically starts at the heel strike point of the heel and goes up through the middle of the posterior facet of subtalar joint. When you get good at looking at these, you get more information from a true axial scan, but that's very difficult to do initially. Or, but these days, for God's sake, just do um, spiral CT scans and reconstruct in any direction we like, which is a great privilege compared to when I started. Um, I think one question is on the soft tissue management of conservative. I think, um, you know, which forceps, whether to use a self retainer or not, uh, I guess the wires and everything which go in as well. Yeah, okay. So um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a naughty person. I have given up using K wires. When I started, yes, I used to put a K wire into the fibula, bend it over so you keep the flap up. These days, I do the approach as I have shown. And I use two um, West retractors. And the bottom part of the West retractor is on the calcaneum, and the top part is on the base of the flat. And they do fine, they don't break down. And if you ever watch a plastic surgeon elevating a flat, they are so brutal. It's unbelievable. They make us look like delicate little flowers. So that's how I do it. I just, and I think. So I try and avoid using a tourniquet now, which I think helps the flap. And I try and minimize the length of time for which the flap's elevated and under tension. And that means doing the surgery as fast as you can. So that's my justification for not putting oodles of K wires and then just using a West or two. Um, Ravi, Vivek, Kamal, um, any questions, guys? It was mesmerizing. Ballpark okay. figure for uh, for uh, primary arthrodesis and the specific indications where you uh, intend doing. So primary arthrodesis, Roy Sanders and I used to have a load of arguments about this. Roy went through a phase of primarily fusing his Sanders Type Four, and he and I used I used to tease him by saying the only reason he had to fuse them was he didn't know how to fix them properly. And he used to get very annoyed with me. But the, my answer to that is, I have had Sanders type two fractures, which have gone on to total chondrolysis, where I knew I had a perfect reduction. I would never have dreamed of doing a primary arthrodesis. I've had Sanders type four fractures, where the patient has ended up with a really good range of subtalar joint movement. And if you think of the biomechanics of the foot, the Taylor slide mechanism, allowing you to do the lateral swing movement of Chopin's joint. I want to preserve that, so I do not do primary subtalar fusions. Vivek, Kamal, any, any other questions at all? And if you, yeah. Sorry, Ravi. If you secondarily have to do it, uh, how early do you... Uh, intend doing it? Well, when the patient comes back with severe subtalar pain. So if they come back with severe subtalar pain, depending on how, um, on what their circumstances are, the first thing I would do is to inject it because sometimes a single injection just takes it away. The second thing I suggest, it depends if they're really keen and they say, look, I've got to get on with my life. I just do a subtalar fusion. But if they are keen to have maximal foot function and will take the risk, I would take the plate out and debride the whole subtalar joint going round the back towards uh, tibios posterior, round the front into tarsi. And oftentimes doing that, because you restore subtalar joint movement, the patients are much improved, not always. So it's, it's up to them. If, if they come back at six months and say, I want to go down the route of trying to preserve subtalar joint movement, because you know, if you have somebody who works on a farm, for instance, it's quite difficult for them to manage without subtalar joint movement. But if it's somebody who says, look, I have to have one operation to get me better, then I say, okay, we'll do a subtalar fusion. 
But if they say, look, I really want to try to preserve my foot, then I would go through the inject it, arthrolysis, and it, it's then up to them. Fair enough. Thank you. Can I uh, kind of thank you, Roger? I mean, that is absolutely wonderful. I mean, lots of old memories, but uh, very, very enjoyable as always. Uh, I think, Roger, I think if you want to, we'd, we'd be happy if you stay on, but I'm going to request now yep. Kamal to uh, take on his his presentation. I think, you know, if uh, DOA ever wants, I think Roger's presentation on, it's called chaos. It's a computer-assisted deformity correction thing, which which was devised. It's actually a very, very interesting talk, and I've, I've, I've heard it before, but it's, very interesting if if you wish to invite him for for that one that that would be good there's a very interesting talk on mal united calculian practice that is also very very interesting but i leave it to the organizers whatever they wish kamal can i request you to uh, start with your talk please yeah. mm. So I have to share my screen. It's open, boss. You can share. You have to unshare first, then only I'll be able to. Uh, Roger, are you Somebody has to unshare. That's why. That's why I'm not able to share. Okay. Any idea who's I? I I don't think somebody is sharing. Nobody's sharing. All right. Yeah, we got it. We Is got my it. screen visible now? Yeah, very, very. But please, please oh. proceed. So okay. this is a case of uh, a polytrauma in foot and ankle and talking about two different series of fractures happening together. And... Uh, <clears throat> I've used the word optimization because sometimes you are in a situation where you have a young male who suffered a polytrauma. So here we see his x-rays. You see the medial clear space widened at ankle and a very small posterior malleolus fracture. You wonder, is this x-ray which he has come with, should you be doing something more or not? So, after this, I said, no, this injury can't be happening alone. So we must have a fracture, which has an x-ray, which has a knee included in that. And that pointed out a mid-shaft fibular fracture. And that's how this kind of an injury qualifies for pronation external rotation stage four with a syndesmotic disruption that is Weber type C. Now, that was not the end of it. This patient also had a complex injury in the foot. So he had a fracture of navicular, fracture of the medial cuneiform. He had a Lisfranc injury involving second, third, and fourth metatarsals. He also had fractures of the shaft of the metatarsal. So it seems as if what previous speakers have talked about, everything is been you know concised here. Everything is there, which has been talked uh, till now in the... So this is the kind of injury pattern which I can list. So there are 10 different fractures, but two or three of them component of post pronation external rotation injuries and then independent, independent fractures of the foot, which you have to deal. So first thing was I advised a CT scan, which gives me a more insight into how do I manage these injuries. And what I see is a large posterior malleolus fragment. I also come to know about the orientation of fracture lines of the navicular to plan my reduction and fixation. I also look at the kind of fracture in the medial cuneiform, the kind of displacements of the tarsal metatarsal joints, the kind of comminution happening at the base of second metatarsal. So a CT scan evaluation is a must whenever you are encountering a situation like this. So this patient is put to a strict limb elevation and anti-inflammatory for seven days. 
this amount of swelling you expect in this kind of a polytrauma would be tremendous and soft tissues they take a priority over the fractures the soft tissues must be in a situation that the it is not a tense swelling and by moving the foot you can see the wrinkles happening on the langan jan uh, lines so that's that's the time when you go in so you counsel your patient for prolonged recovery and rehabilitation in this type of a polytrauma and you optimize the patient ex expectation uh, at the end so i took up this patient after a week put him in the floppy lateral position and the sequence was i first took up fibula reduced it put a plate then i took up the posterior malleolus through the posterior lateral approach reduced buttress plating and then i did the syndesmotic reduction and i used two syndesmotic screws to restore the medial clear space and tibio fibular overlap that they were restored and why do i use two screws because this is a high velocity injury it has got quite a major ligamentous disruption whole of the intraosseous ligament also gets torn because the fracture is high up in the mid region of the fibula so to stabilize these kind of syndesmotic disruption uh, and that too in a young guy i always pass two syndesmotic screws now we come to the foot and in the foot we start the sequence from the hind foot and then move towards the mid foot or the fore foot that's the sequence to be followed so i fix my navicular with 2 3.5 mm herbert screws reduce them and then pass screws over them and then i reduce the medial cuneiform but when i'm doing this medial cuneiform reduction i'm passing these screws right up to the middle cuneiform because there was a disruption of the uh, intercuneiform joint also so these screws are going to help me achieve two in one reducing the medial cuneiform as well as reducing the intercuneiform distance so this was done through a medial approach all these navicular medial cuneiform and first mt they were exposed through a medial incision and then when i am done with that i open the uh, uh, another I, i put another incision that is a dorsal lateral incision over the third metatarsal and then i provisionally fix the second tmt the third tmt the fourth tmt that's the first thing i do and then i start putting in sequence my plates plate on the medial side and then the home run screw and then the locking plate which locks second and third tmt joints and makes them more stable and then i go ahead and fix the diaphyseal fracture with a simple wire which is going right up to the tip uh, while the comminuted fracture of the third metatarsal was fixed with a small straight plate and that's how all these uh, fractures were stabilized in these on the same sitting so Uh, such a big work i was expecting something big can happen and yes there was a marginal superficial skin necrosis which was dealt by basically delayed suture removal at 4 weeks and strict limb elevation so that was what i was looking at the uh, fracture reductions at the end with a good anatomical position and this patient went on to non weight bearing ambulation for 8 weeks and followed by the partial weight bearing ambulation the next four weeks throughout when the sutures were removed uh, he was put in a compression stocking so that the edema could be controlled and this was the final result at eight weeks and then he moved on to a full weight bearing ambulation at 12 weeks while the compression stocking is still on so i was quite satisfied that i mean taking up these fractures in a sequence and getting them anatomically reduced could make him mobile again at 12 weeks which appears to be a decent result so what do i talk about optimization now very word which i have used is that first thing is 
it should be a delayed intervention. You should not jump on to doing these cases on the day one or day two. Wait for the edema to subside, and then the chances of your wound complication would reduce. And when you're doing such a big surgery, plan that first part of the surgery you can do without tunicate. So you've applied the tunicate, but don't apply, don't inflate it. So you, I fixed the whole PER injury without tunicate and that too in the floppy lateral position and then change the position midway to from floppy lateral to supine for dealing with foot injuries. And then I did sequential open reduction internal fixation of foot injuries, which was under tunicate. And provisional fixation of all the TMT joints, first to fourth, should always be done first before you start fixing them definitively. And definitive fixation sequence, as I said, should also be from medial side going to the lateral side. A home run screw for the list rank is a very important thing before doing the definitive fixation. And you can do always, if you know that you have to deal so many fractures, try to do the closure after deflating the tunicate so that you can control your bleeding, you can maintain hemostasis, create a hemostasis and do a good job. And this is the message which I just want to give. And another passing message which already has been conveyed by the previous speakers, but the anatomical restoration of all TMT joints is very important. As you know, we have three columns. The medial is restored first and fixed rigidly, middle next and fixed rigidly. Lateral does not require a rigid fixation. You can leave them on the K-wire and simply reduce, and you can remove this K-wire at six weeks from the date of surgery. And by that time, this, this, this is well stabilized because we know the importance of reducing the medial column, which forms a longitudinal as well as a cross arch and the second TMT joint is like a you know keystone in the Roman arch and carries a lot of importance. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, awesome case Kamal and I think wonderful wonderful fixation. I'm sure the patient is going to do well. These are very disabling injuries and you know the swelling doesn't settle down. The foot feels so funny for a, such a long time. It, this is this is a six to eight, six to nine months recovery period, in my opinion, for this kind of an injury. Um, uh, we'll take some questions, and Ravi, you can start your uh, screen share in the meanwhile. Yeah, yeah. Doctor uh, Kamal has to stop uh, his uh, screen share. Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, any any questions? We're open for. I think uh, Kamal is open for any questions. <clears throat> yeah. Kamal, is there any way of sort of reducing the chances of uh, skin? I think one you said was delaying. Second, you said reduce the tunicate time. Third, you said was uh, close the uh, close the wound after the tunicate is released. Um, you 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 just elevate the leg on uh, on two or three pillows uh, post op. Is that what you would do? Yeah, I mean two pillows are enough. I mean it doesn't sound that you keep increasing the pillows and you reduce chance. I don't think so that way. Yeah, I mean. Few things I've been learning gradually is don't hesitate to give long incisions because the longer the incision, the less is the stretching of the skin or retractions of the skin, and then you have a less chance of you know necrosis of the uh, skin. Sure. Um, anything else, Vivek? Anything you would like to add? Because I think you guys see a lot more of this than than we do. No, I think that uh, Dr. Dureja has manage that case excellent yeah. the way it has been because it's a I would say the same captain matured have pura ka pura put into surgery ke liye. so Wait. that he has covered most of the things out there what I would like to say is that many times in polytrauma situation the foot things are neglected yes. and are missed it has happened in my level one trauma centers also that we have concentrated more on the other things and have yeah. missed on and then later on, once the patient has got recovered and has been able to complain of pain, then we are able to find out. So a high degree of suspicion for such missed cases, especially Liz Franks and the midfoot and the injuries, 
should always be there in situations which are polytraumatized. So that needs to be sensitized. All the doctors needs to be sensitized and then follow what Dr. Dureja did. Okay. That's what. Wonderful. Uh, Ravi, can you start, please? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Gurinder. And uh, after mesmerizing talks, uh, uh, now uh, it is my due to take you through a uh, crush injury. Uh, basically, we'll be talking about treatment philosophy and management. He is the case, 26 years, uh, who presented with uh, such kind of a uh, uh, complex uh, foot injury. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk in detail. This is, uh, this is after uh, the debride, debrima of the leg. There was a reverse uh, injury into the reverse flap into the leg. Basically, uh, today's uh, learning objective would be these are two diverse presentation of a high energy injuries. Uh, to the foot where their integument is intact, it leads to compartment syndrome and where there is a shear of the soft tissue with complex fractures and the fracture dislocations. So there is a compartment syndrome and there is a crush syndrome. So uh, we'll talk about a few tips and tricks of a compartment release and also a stage reconstruction. One must start uh, broad coverage with the antibiotics and uh, in uh, to in case of a, uh, it is an emergency, you should take up these patients. Uh, may require a serial debridement, a skeletal anatomical restoration, external fixator initially, and uh, later on uh, may require a definitive fixation to prevent ischemia, infection, and CRPS and amputation in these patients. These are the mechanisms. These are three different types of injury. Type one is basically heavy object with a closed integument and a laceration with type 2 is a laceration with the open fracture and in a type 3 it is a sheer uh, degloving avulsion uh, type of a tissue damage because of the tangential force which I have already uh, shown you the case. We will come to that uh, in a while. Uh, in uh, closed high energy trauma these are uh, patients who present with the disproportionate pain uh, there will be a tense swelling and plantar chymosis, which would be there and also uh, inability or difficulty to move the toes. And uh, the, the, so one should have a very low threshold to measure the uh, intracompartment pressures in these patients. Anatomical locations of these, uh, there, because of the paucity of time, I'm not going to into details what these compartments are. And there are approximately uh, nine total compartments. There are four introsious compartments, one... Uh, adductor compartment, one lateral compartment, two central or one central and uh, one medial compartment and one calcaneal compartment, which is known as deep calcaneal compartment. So how to take care about them? Basically, normal pressure in these compartments is eight millimeter of mercury. And if it is more than 10 to 30 of a diastolic pressure, uh, it is an indication for a fasciotomy. These are various incisions which are described. This is how it would show uh, on a clinical uh, basis, uh, there may be a blistering and uh, also if the pressure is more than 30, it would require a release immediately. The two incisions, uh, dorsal and one medial incision, uh, which uh, are good enough to release all the nine compartments and uh, this is how the medial incision, uh, you know, uh, these are the uh, uh, different types of uh, incisions, one incision also described two medial incisions. So when you go, go to the two dorsal incision, that itself can release the deep uh, uh, compartment and a medial incision is good enough for the release of the uh, calcaneal compartment. Uh, so uh, in these cases, one can uh, leave these uh, wounds open for at least uh, eight to 10 days uh, and then uh, they can be grafted. Uh, whack dressing may be required in certain cases where skin loss is extensive. If you do not uh, recognize the compartment, there is a uh, risk of a contracture, deformity, sensory changes, weakness, stiffness, paralysis, and uh, atrophy and a chronic pain in these patients. Uh, it requires immediate diagnosis and aggressive treatment and a permanent myoneural damage can be prevented and a quick aggressive treatment decreases the ischemic contractures and also regional complex pain syndrome in these patients. The other pattern which I was talking to, you, uh, which I'm showing you is... Uh, open crush injury. These are various uh, motor vehicular accidents or a power saw or a landmine injuries. Uh, there may be uh, extensive complex tissue involvement, including the fractures. 
and sometimes because of the crushing of the forefoot one may need to do amputation primarily uh, the consequence of uh, these are basically high energy uh, high morbidity and a prompt meticulous care is required 50 percent of these patients will have a residual pain and 25 percent of these patients have a poor results as far as the principles are concerned basically history examination mechanism of injury neurovascular uh, status of these patients uh, to know whether there is a contusion, abrasion, or penetrating type of uh, injury compartment should not be missed. X ray, advanced imaging uh, is helpful. Degree of a crush injury, early soft tissue coverage, and a fracture stabilization, internal fixation with the K wires, and external stabilization of the foot in neutral position, and stability uh, of the uh, soft tissue determines uh, 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 when to use the definitive fixation in these patients with plates. Crush syndrome, you have to be careful because uh, myoglobinuria and also a potassium or a phosphorus which gets released lead to hypovolemic shock, hypercalcemia, uh, and also it require it may end up into an acute renal uh, failure. Antibiotics, obviously, first generation cephalosporins are the uh, are enough for type one and two, but uh, amino glycosides are added in type three. They say in a palm injury you require required to add penicillin. Antibiotics should be given as soon as patient reports in emergency within three hours. Uh, and uh, these are the various principles. You have to know the zone of uh, injury to prevent, uh, 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 may require a serial debridement and a soft tissue coverage should be given early. In, in cases where the bones are exposed, tendons are exposed, primary uh, split skin graft does not work. And uh, serial debridements uh, and uh, uh, rotation of the muscles can be uh, uh, added in these situations. And uh, full thickness flap or uh, uh, help from the plastic league is very, very important and surgical stabilization uh, uh, required in these patients, rigid fixation uh, when the local wound gets healed and decrease, uh, definitely decreases the rate of infection. And finally, a definitive fixation can be done once the skin is stable. Limited subcutaneous dissection and a minimal soft tissue dissection uh, should be done. And uh, debridement uh, of a non-viable tissue is essential before any, uh, initiating the early soft tissue coverage. These principles have been already covered by previous uh, uh, colleagues in their talks. This is the case where there was an extensive injury. And uh, if you go in detail, you would see the extent of a damage to the tissue subtalar dislocation, there are complex injuries, metatarsal fractures, and so and so forth. And uh, you can see the extent of a splinter skin. They have a very, very poor prognosis. And this is the patient which recently tackled. We did the uh, uh, subtalar primary fusion and uh, fixation of the various metatarsals. Uh, and uh, uh, after a stabilization uh, in the external fixator, he is uh, now undergoing uh, uh, back therapy. And this is uh, today's... Uh, this thing needs another debrima, uh, 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 which is posted next uh, uh, today, uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is the another case, uh, which uh, which was the first case which I showed you. Uh, this is the kind of a uh, uh, picture on the table after a debrima in these patients, and uh, this is the staged reconstruction uh, which was done gradually. And these are various uh, details of a procedure. And you can see on the IITV, these are the various uh, fixations which have uh, performed and eventually stabilized in the external frame. And uh, later on, uh, skin was uh, grafted. And this is how it looked after uh, now six months down the lane. And uh, these are the results uh, this patient has. Uh, he's uh, able to run and do all the uh, activities. Uh, And uh, most of these patients require non-weight bearing and protection. So elevation is very important above the level of heart. Uh, in summary, closed high energy injuries, uh, be very suspicious of a compartment syndrome. And uh, uh, so these are two dorsal incision and one medial incision, which is enough to release all the nine compartments. Open complex injuries, uh, basically uh, there may be systemic complications. You have to be careful. Uh, to take them up uh, very early, broad spectrum of antibiotic in emergency, uh, emergency debrima, and also antibiotic uh, uh, anti, um, anatomical restoration initially with the K wire and external fixation. Early full thickness coverage uh, must be given to these patients. Uh, 
uh, with the help of a plastic colleague and that decreases the risk of uh, uh, that can help uh, reduce uh, help uh, definitive fixation and also reduces the risk of uh, infection hospital stay and overall costs for these patients uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity and if you have uh, questions uh... awesome ravi i mean these are so frustrating injuries so time consuming this takes a sweat out of you i mean you know every wire passing the wire stabilizing it but i think you know i mean i i i, I don't know if roger is still there but i mean roger is a bit of a maverick within the within the orthopedic uh, circles and he says look i can tell you this is compartment syndrome of the foot is a over exaggerated entity again he's a stand alone for that he says you know by the time you make those multiple incisions by the time you do all the fish out me he says you cannot reconstruct the foot according to him again i'm just putting a view point he says you know you should just concentrate he says the worst thing you get with the compartment syndrome of the foot again this is a one man thing it's cloying he says that's all that you'll get he says you can actually correct the cloying with some sort of fusions or get and all but lot of what we what we hear about in terms of you know all the other complications doesn't happen in the foot according to him i mean i i haven't seen that many compartments in uh, my person view but he says concentrate on if you open the whole foot out you will never it will no. it, it will be a problem forever but in these cases actually we primarily stabilize the skeleton and if you stabilize the skeleton with the k wires that is good enough to relieve the com, you know uh, compartment and also quickly uh foot returns back uh, to normal shape yes. and uh, functions concentrate on the on, on the reduction concentrate yes. so your yes, that your is very very absent. important concentrate on the reductions concentrate yes. on the yes. stabilization absolutely to restore the anatomy and see what happens absolutely. Okay. that is primarily done and that is primarily done. absolutely right guys any any questions at all i mean that's a very 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 difficult cases we've seen so it basically encompasses a lot of the basic principles and all So, if any questions, otherwise we can. Uh, in the meanwhile, I think we can start a screen share. Gurinder. Yeah. yeah, it's me, Shaker. Hi, Shaker. How are you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we take on the next talk, can I announce something? Oh, please, please, please do. Sorry, Shaker. So, uh, the DOA will be conducting their first offline uh, meeting next week. so you know that uh, last month uh, we were supposed to do our first quarterly meet but that got postponed because of uh, covid thing so next sunday we'll be doing our first quarterly meet and that will be at le meridian and it's being organized by uh, minal sharma and uh, dr anuj dingra and it will be focusing on uh, knee arthroplasties so i invite all of you and uh, all of those who have logged in please do register and uh, just uh, attend the meeting So it, it's on Sunday. Shaker starts off in the early morning and goes the whole day. Yes, it's on Sunday. Starts at ten, and uh, will go on till one p.m. So it is. It's a half day program. And Shaker, which, which is the next lunch? lunch. <laughs> okay. And which is the next meeting that we have on the on the series? So so the next in this series will be on hip trauma, and that will be next month on twenty sixth. So that again will be on the Saturday. uh that will be uh, moderated by samarth and uh, uh, it will be again on uh, saturday 8 pm that we got a very good collection i think from the previous executive and from you all we got a very good collection of a series of actually meetings which this thing i think but you know shekhar you, you guys are taking so much of an effort you must go national in this you must go into all the national forums and advertise i know ortho tv does it but if we can also do our own thing yeah and and but, that the today's talk is also going on very well and uh, uh, i must congratulate you and all the speakers so let's continue with this please okay so i hope i am visible and audible and i'll start with my talk and the brief given by gurinder was skip everything just concentrate on cases and do the challenges of fracture tell us i think it is so my learning objectives are i'll just deal with the various challenges based on the cases regarding timing regarding the approaches to be used how do you reduce it and if there are any methods of fixation by case discussions first look at timing so whenever we have a talus fracture most probably and most commonly they are of the neck fractures we need to look at what sort of fracture it is maybe with an x-ray or with a ct scan 
Besides the X-rays and the CT scans and the dislocations which are there, we need to look at the soft tissues, which are so very important in talus fracture. If you see the first X CT scan, it looks okay. It is the talus body is inside the joint. If you look at the next CT scan on the right hand side, you see it is dislocated posteriorly, and that clinical condition on the back side is going to lead to pressure necrosis. And if you leave it, then you are going in for problems. So that's why you need to look at the soft tissues, which are important. So what are the features of injury and treatment which can predict osteonecrosis? Remember, the timing of injury is not predictive of higher avian rates till the soft tissues are not involved. If the soft tissues are involved or the fracture is displaced or dislocated, then they are going to lead to osteonecrosis. So for a standard simple talus neck fractures, fixing it in the night is not necessary. You can have all your fracture fixation methods and armamentarium and then fix it, provided it is the soft tissues are normal and you don't have any necrosis which is going to be impending. They are not inherent surgical emergencies. They are urgent surgical emergencies, so as to say. Then we come to the approaches. Now, this is a fracture which is of the posterior part. Where are you going to access it? From the anterior or posterior? Here, you go from the posterolateral approaches, which are so common. If you want to go, you can go from the back, open up, and the FHLs can be retracted. And along with that, you can see the capsule and the phthalus posterior processes can be fixed through that approach. And that's what we have done in this case. So look at the fracture, look at the CT scan, understand where the fracture is, and accordingly you need to fix. So what do we do for Hawkins type 3 fractures, which includes a dislocation, a fracture of the talus neck with the dislocation of the body, most commonly posteromedially, sometimes very rarely, but posterolaterally as well. In these cases, with the damaged or precarious skin conditions, you need to look and do the fixation urgently, understand the fracture pattern, look at all the visual scans, the lateral sagittal sections, and see what all things you need to understand here. Here you have got communication, you have got a dislocation, you need to fix it properly, the reduction needs to be achieved and then maintained. And then the challenges of soft tissues. So you have got a lot of challenges which are mixed into this. So remember, whenever you see a Hawkins 3, beware of all these conditions and the things which you need to look for. In these cases, you go by combined approaches, which is both anteromedial and anterolateral. Because remember, talus is having a peculiar sort of an anatomy, which is slightly posterior, inferior, medially directed neck, which you need to recreate. If you recreate it in an excessive way, it is going to lead to varus. If you do not lead it and lead it into straight valgus, it is going to cause problems in the foot mechanics. So here, once you have such a fracture, you require good muscle relaxant intraoperatively. If required, use a distractor normally relax the posterior part of muscles, which will help in addressing that fracture, uh, the fragment which has gone posteriorly. Try to maintain and bring back that space in the talus. If you are looking at the talus dislocated bone, that you can do by a distractor or a calcaneal pin. And then only when you are having that bone and the gap there, you can bring back the broken fragment back into its place where the space has to be. Otherwise, the tendoiculus is going to pull the calcaneus up. And even if you're able to reduce, you will not be able to reduce it properly into the joint. Whenever you are reducing a talus dislocation, which has gone back, usually a medial malleolus is, is broken. And it is that's why that fracture and the body is able to go backwards. But it gets rotated in two different planes. So you need to understand where the articular fragments and the cartilage is, use it as a thick joystick and then try to reduce it because it is just not by pushing in that it will get in. 
you need to rotate it or derotate it in two different planes and then only it comes back. So this is the same fracture which we fixed and we saw the CT scans of. The medial malleolus was broken, which was used as an entry place and helped in assisting the reduction and the derotation of that fragment. That entire space, which was empty, needs to be brought back. And then you can fix it by screws, which are from both anteromedial and posterior and the anterolateral areas. And you can get follow-up x-rays with at least good union and some amount of avian, which looks like, but it is just revascularizing, which I would say. This is his range of motion. You can see the both the incisions which are there. And in my hands, most of my, or rather all of my talus fractures will go in with a dual approach to recreate that anteromedial curvature and the anatomy which I need so very well to recreate. Then brings the challenges of combination. When you have this, we have dealt with dislocation, then combination. You can see here, once you have tried to reduce it with a joystick, with the calcaneal pin, and we are trying to put in the K wires for the reduction, there is another big fragment which is there. And now just two screws are not going to hold it back. If you put in partially threaded screws also, they are going to compress it in a different way. So you require something more for these fractures. And for that, you need to put in plates. A locking plate helps you to maintain that reduction which you have achieved. But remember, talus is having a nearly 70% articular cartilage, and there is very less amount of bone where you can put in the plate. So that's what you need to look for. And you mostly get that area on the lateral aspect around the lateral process and then next to the calcaneal neck to the talus head. And from between that area, you might be able to put in a plate. Medial side is slightly difficult. Here, after fixation of those two big fragments, that triangular fragment was put separately fixed with a screw. But to maintain that reduction till the talus unites, you need to have a stabilizing feature, which is that lateral locking plate. And that's what the intraoperative images show you the reduction. This is his post-op clinical image. You can see the two approaches which have been used. And this is his follow-up where we can see that, yes, it is in a process of union. So when do we use lateral plate and how do we use it? It is used for the lateral process, between the lateral process and the talar neck. You direct the screws towards the body as well as to the head and the neck region. And the lateral plate is acting as a tension band, maintaining the reduction and preventing the varus collapse by uh, having a locking plate, a good fixation. You can have a 2.4 plate or a 2.7 plate, which gives you adequate amount of stability and to maintain that reduction in a comminuted talus fracture. Sometimes you will have fractures where you, if you see it is in this fracture, the lateral column is having a single fracture line, whereas the medial side is comminuted. And that's a very common thing which can happen. Here we tried to, and he had some issues with his calcium and he had some initial bony issues. The bones were not so properly, I would say, having a good purchase. The screw fixation was done and we put in a medial plate to maintain that reduction which we had achieved by using a locking plate on the medial side. The plate which we used was of 2 mm plate. And I think that it was not a, the best plate. It was a lot of combination and compression, which we had to disimpact. And then we used a locking plate on the medial side to fix that fracture. And as you see that heel, and you can see those triads onto the distal part of tibia as well, having some calcium issues which were there. But in the end, he had no pain. But later on, if you see that plate had broken out there, this means that it was not as sturdy as we required it to be. And maybe a 2.4 or a 2.7 plate could have been a better use for this. So when do we use the medial plate? We use the medial plate to bridge the zone of combination and to prevent shortening of the varus. It holds the comminuted fragment in the disimpacted position and maintains that reduction till it unites. And remember that on the medial side, we have a very small extra articular area to put that plate. So be aware and beware of putting it because the, then the medial malleolus comes into the plane and it can obstruct and cause problems when you are having dorsi and plantar flexions. 
Just a brief regarding Tyler body, it also creates problems. And for this, most of the time, if it is a medial malleolus fracture, you can go inside the talus. The visualization of body can only be when you remove the medial malleolus or osteotomy. You just cannot fix it without doing it. You may say you have done a good job, but you are missing out on the bigger chunk of the body of talus if you are not having a complete visualization back posteriorly. And that's what happens here. You can see the good amount of talus body, which you can see having an entire fracture, which can very easily be reduced, appreciated and fixed if you do an osteotomy. If the injury provides you with an osteotomy or a fracture of medial malleolus, it's well and good as it was here. And this is how we fixed it. We are able to fix it and the reduction and the maintenance of fracture fixation was good. And the results as well. But sometimes in a difficult fracture, a highly comminuted fracture, which you need to fix to at least maintain the morphology of the talus, even if it is highly comminuted, you have to do a medial malleus osteotomy to look at the body. And that's how you do it. You go at the angle, the shoulder of your medial malleus or the pylon, put in your K-wires, which are perpendicular to the direction of the medial malleus screws, which you're going to put. Ensure that you're having a V-shape because you do not want to go into the pylon area and take out a major chunk of your distal articular surface of the tibia. And once you do that, osteotomize, I always pre drill them so that the screws can be put there and then we fix that. This is the medial malleolar osteotomy, how you need to do it perpendicular to the direction, infratectal at the shoulder of medial malleolus making sure that the posterior tibial has been prevented and protected while you are putting in your sauce. This is what we were able to achieve here and the fixation, but later on, it, he has gone into some arthritis as well as avascular necrosis. So I'll just finish. I've shown you all the challenges which can be there in talus fractures based on my cases. The take homes for here for any talus fracture will be Dual approach is very important. Just don't rely on one. You are compromising on your recreation of the talus morphology. Get a dual approach inside. You can put two sorts of screws, which might be positional or lag screws, depending upon the amount of combination, just like you do for your neck fractures of the femoral neck. In today's world, keep other options which are available. The small fragment, 2, 2.4, 2.7 plates, which can be contoured locking plates, which will be helpful with small screws. In talus body fractures, preferably do a medial malleolar osteotomy, go at the shoulder perpendicular to the direction of screws. And there's no question that operative management gets at least back the good results. I would can dare say that there's no role of doing a K-wire fixation nowadays in the world for talus fractures and the neck fractures. Accurate reduction with stable fixation is the essential thing. But remember, in spite of your best efforts, in Hawkins 3 and Hawkins 4, I can say with my experience that nearly 30 to 40 percent of them will have some sort of an arthritis or any vascular necrosis with whatever amount of fixation you have done. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Vivek. As always, very, very comprehensive, wonderful collection of cases, I think. I mean, you really have a huge subset. I mean, I think you showed one example of pretty much everything. Um, Abhishek, while you're loading your screen, we'll take any questions as well. Sure. I, I, I think the drive home points are absolutely clear. I mean, you have to, you have to operate, you have to fix, you have to get a rigid fixation, and especially the body ones. I mean, the dual approach for the for the body and the neck for the for the head and the neck fractures. Plate application is a problem. I mean, there is very, very little. You you're really struggling for space out there. I mean, it's it's not very easy putting a plate in this. You think you know it looks like very easy. You go in there and there's very little room. If there no no questions at all, I think I'm going to request Abhishek. I'm, I'm my, Abhishek, my apologies. I delayed you too much. I I'm sorry. I should should, should have hastened thing up. Uh, when Prof. Atkins was talk, uh, talking. So I think, you know, fifth minute tassel is such a common, common thing. And surprisingly, you know, I mean, you see so many people still come in with so many issues. It's just basically because of lack of, you know, clarity in our minds and how we should take this forward, which one requires what to be done. 
every forum I am on will put up a 15 minute task to track it at least once a week to discuss what, what do I do about this. Um, Sheikh has been, I think all of us uh, know him very, very well. He's been contributing a lot to our food and ankle practices in Delhi and runs a wonderful clinic as well. I've asked him to talk about this and settle uh, as many controversies as he can based on his huge experience and also some of the literature that he would he might like to use. Vishik, my apologies for the delay, but please start. All right, sir. No problem. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much, DOA, for having me here. And uh, after all after all the lectures by the stalwarts, this would be my closure stuff. All wells that at least ends. So I start here. Um, just an introduction, metatarsal fractures, they are very frequently encountered, 5-6% to 6 injuries in primary care setting. In adults, PKG is second to fifth decade. Most common is fifth metatarsal fracture, accounting for 68% of all metatarsal fractures. Um, Lawrence and Bottle gave a classification for the base of fifth metatarsal fracture. We are very well aware of this. Just a repetition, zone was is tuberosity fracture, which accounts for 93% of fifth metatarsal base. Zone 2 is metaphyseal diaphyseal which account for 4% and zone 3 include uh, proximal 1.5 cm of diaphysis, which account for 3% of uh, proximal 5th uh, metatarsal fracture. Now, something about zone 1 fracture. So mostly it's uh, basic of uh, the metatarsal, 5th metatarsal fracture. Uh, the cases I'll discuss in the end. So 93% of proximal 5th metatarsal fractures, typically avulsion injuries, acute episodes of forefoot supination with plantar flexion, result in a sudden pull by plantar fascia and peroneus brevis and thus cause the avulsion. Fracture pattern is usually transverse to slightly oblique, occasionally com comminuted, may also disturb the uh, fifth metatarsal cuboid joint. Zone 2 is the metaphyseal diaphyseal fracture, 4%. Uh, results from an acute episode. The exact mechanism is not known, but somehow it's largely because of an adduction force applied to the forefoot with the ankle plantar flexed. And zone three fractures are diaphyseal stress fractures. 3% of all the base, uh, fifth metatarsal base fractures, they typically result from a fatigue or a stress mechanism. Dilly described stress is spontaneous fracture of normal bone that results from summation of stresses, any of which by itself would be harmless otherwise. Then we have a torque classification. Sorry, I, I think I missed on the X-ray, but still I'll go ahead. TOR type 1 fractures are presumed to be acute fractures at the site of pre-existing stress. These are acute stress fractures, uh, concentration on the lateral cortex that become acutely disabling when they extend across the entire diaphysis. We have TOR 2 which is actually delayed union and, uh, and are distinguished by having a previous injury or fracture with radiographic features of a widened fracture line and evidence of intramedullary sclerosis. TOR3 is actually non-union where the medullary canal is sclerotic and obliterated and with a history of repetitive trauma and recurrent symptoms. Now, why are we talking so much about base of fifth metatarsal fracture? Because of the non-union. The, the vascular anatomy is as understood that we have three sets of uh, vascular supply, nutrient arteries, metaphyseal arteries, and periosteal arteries. Now, there is a va vascular watershed zone in the zone two between neutral nutrient and the metaphyseal perforators contributing to the high non-union rates. So if you see the green color zone, that is where the metaphyseal and nutrient artery don't reach approximately each other. And the avascular zone is created leading to high chances of high rates of non-union. Now radiograph, three standard radiograph we take lateral AP and 45 degree oblique. Interestingly, Acute stress fractures are typically not detected on the standard three views of the foot many a times. Therefore, we need to repeat the radiographs at 10 to 14 days and it becomes and it is disclosed. Sorry, it is disclosed as a radiolucent reabsorption gap around the fracture. In case of complex midfoot trauma, as Dr. Dureja very well elucidated, CT scan is a must. Now, treatment options, we have conservative, cast or boots, surgical screws, plates, tension band wiring, and we can also have bone graft for chronic non-union gap. Non-operative management. The outcomes of non-operative treatment for non-displaced zone one fractures, which is the tuberosity fracture, are good with low non-union rates, as low as 0.5 to 
acute zone 2 and torr type 1 fractures are managed with non weight bearing short leg cast for 6 to 8 weeks however torr type 1 may be immobilized for as long as 20 weeks for union to occur now these are some of the comparison studies we are for comparing the boots and casts now if you compare between air cast boot compared to the walking cast the pain and function recovered quicker with air cast boot no difference in time to union between the two groups if we compare heart sole shoe and below knee cast no difference between clinical healing results if we compare between the cast and the soft jones dressing the average time to union was 33 days and 46 days respectively for soft dressings and rigid casting so whatever we use as as a, a, a non operative method with a cast or boot it's more or less the same thing now indication for surgery zone 1 zone 1 fracture with more than 3 mm of displacement second if the fracture fragment involves more than 30% of cubo metatarsal joint and third fractures with larger than 2 mm step off involving the joint surface for zone 2 acute and delayed union zone 2 fractures may be managed non operatively however operative management with the intramedullary screw should be considered for athletes now indication for surgery of zone 3 zone 3 fractures that are tog type 2 and 3 should be done or if with the intramedullary screw fixation for non athlete prolonged immobilization is required and a non union may still result highly active individuals with type 2 diaphyseal stress fractures should be operated symptomatic non unions of zone 2 and zone 3 fractures and lastly neck and shaft fractures with greater than 10 degrees of plantar angulation or 3 mm of displacement in any plane where close reduction is insufficient now something which needs to be washed out if your patient has a varus heel then they must be taken care of such patient require correction of the varus to prevent refracture after operative or non operative treatment and our non uh, conservative options are uh, in sole with a lateral hind foot wedge and operatively if the varus is too much then we might have to do a dwise or sort me to correct the alignment what are our operative options we have intramedullary screw cortico cancellous bone graft k wire pinnings though it is out now it's out fashion now just to uh, mention open induction and internal fixation with plates and tension band wiring zone 1 fractures one can do k wires if the fragment is very small tension band wiring a small headless screw and if the evals fragment is really too small then it can be excised the next is percutaneous fixation with intramedullary screw preferred treatment choice for zone 2 and zone 3 fractures the advantage is they are minimally invasive and compression can be achieved decrease healing time what are our options for intramedullary devices solid 4.5 mm malleolus screw 4 mm cancellous 4.5 mm cannulated and 6.5 cancellous screw however currently the most accepted technique for non unions is open curettage of the non union site followed by intramedullary screw placement now something about the screw diameter a theory the studies have said that the larger the screw diameter the better the fixation would be however we have to take consideration of the anatomy of the fifth metatarsal the fifth metatarsal has a lateral curvature and a plantar bow and its shaft morphology is variable which makes choosing the correct screw challenging they recommended using the largest diameter screw possible keeping in mind using a larger diameter medullary screw in a narrow canal can result in diaphyseal fracture so please watch out we need to have a large diameter screw but the bow and the curve of the fifth metatarsal shaft has to be respected tension band wiring only for small fragments that are not amenable to screw fixation plate is ideal for combination what about post of weight bearing post of foot should be mobilized mobilized and kept non weight bearing the period of non weight bearing should be around 1 to 2 week with progressive weight bearing in a short leg walking cast for 4 to 6 weeks a functional brace or foot orthosis can be given for athletic or highly strenuous competitive activity person 
Following inlay cortical cancellous bone grafting, the patient should be immobilized and non-weight bearing for six weeks. Now here are some cases, just they are small cases, I'll go fast. He's a young male, zone three fracture, TOG type two, because there is some uh, sclerosis and uh, uh, medullary obliteration. Initially treated with cast, X-ray after four months of non-union and pain. This was done, uh, uh, percutaneous screw fixation. And it went on for healing in around three months time. Case two, this is a simple zone one tuberosity fracture. Um, a headless uh, a CFT, this is an arthritis CFT screw was put and uh, no step at the cubometatarsal joint healed pretty well. Now the third one is uh, a young male with fresh zone one intraarticular fracture, no combination. However, primary plating was done but a headless screw could have done a better job. And such a hardware, such a loaded hardware was actually not required. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Abhishek. That was, uh, that was, I think, all that I thought we would all need to know and all that would need to be covered. Um, Shekhar, Atul, any, 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 any suggestions, any queries? And the rest of the faculty, if there are any, any questions to put forward or any views? It was an excellent uh, presentation and uh, all the speakers were really very, very good talks and Dr. Roger is not here, but when he was talking, we have, everybody thought that he's just telling a story and everybody wanted him to go on and on. And I thank all, all the speakers, especially Gurinder, you have been uh, great to have a galaxy of these special speakers, especially Dr. Roger for this seminar and uh, Dr. Vivek and Dr. Uh, Kamal, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Abhishek, Dr. Ankit, all have are excellent and I want to thank all of you for you. joining us tonight and we extended the time but it was worth spending and we all were uh, benefited by these talks and I, I think that whosoever today joined on our uh, seminar, there was to be uh, by the knowledge by these different teachers uh, and well taken your Gurinder's point that uh, we should aim for pan India uh, involvement for our because so much hard work is there with organizing these type of uh, symposiums and if more exposure is there then hopefully it will um, also well taken and in next, next seminar we will try that. Shekhar to add something. Again I will uh, uh, invite you all for the uh, 26th Sunday's uh, knee arthroplasty first quarterly meet of DOA uh, which will be a physical meet after a very long time and uh, I expect that all the members who are on uh, symposium today will definitely join us. 10 a.m. we start and by lunchtime we uh, finish the feast. Uh, uh, I think uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Ortho Devi. Uh, they have been a great help. And uh, Dr. Ravi Chauhan. Uh, he has been the person who is behind all this, organizing this thing, uh, preparing the flyers. Uh, then uh, he has been uh, talking with the Ortho TV guys. So Ravi, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Ravi. And 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 all the speakers, all the talks were uh, quite excellent. And uh, most of all, they were interactive, and uh, everyone can relate to those situations which uh, they showed. And Gurinder, three cheers. As always. As yeah. always. Yeah. As okay. always. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gurinder. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's time to close now. Uh, good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so See much. See you all everybody. on Sunday. See you all on Sunday. Okay, G. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.